here will introduce our group. So, how many verses do you want? Uh, how about first and last? Awesome. Hymn 117. say like Brother Robin said, it's good to be with you. It really is good to be with them though, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. it um, it's not just a token statement when we make, when we say that. Uh, I really look forward to it. I look forward to when we can come together like this. I, I know I look forward to visiting you in your classrooms more than you look forward to being visited in your classrooms probably. <laughs> but um, it really is inspiring and wonderful. And, um, I, I feel kind of fueled by your, your diligence and the fire. I, I, I love it. So it's good to be with you. I mean it. Um, early on, this I'm passing around a talk that was given last August by Brother Kelly Hawes, the Associate Administrator for Seminaries and Institutes. Shortly after this talk was given, we had discussed that we felt like it, it ought to be a focus of, of study for us here but because of several different things that we either observed or felt um, needed to get our attention. This kept getting bumped. And now, I'm, I'm kind of glad it did. Um, because, hi. Because it allows us, for our new folks that have just joined us this semester, it allows us to be able to, uh, to talk about it together with you. Um, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> you were trying to get a copy for you. I thought you were asking if you could have them out. Um, this talk, seek to obtain my, first seek to obtain my word by Brother Hawes, um, could become required reading for, uh, for our 471 students. This is, we're kind of reevaluating the required readings for 471, and I wonder if this one might make the cut. It's pretty amazing. Brother Martin, you had a, you had a 
was just trying to get one. Okay. I was trapped. Really sassy for me to make you walk away from me. <laughs> um, we're going to take, we, we will not have time to go through this entire talk. I'm hoping that we'll be able to identify a principle or two that will impress you and, and, and stick with you when it's time to prepare your next lesson and every lesson after that. And I'm hoping also that maybe this will kindle enough interest that you're going to go back and look much closer in a more um, deliberate way at what he had to say. Um, by virtue of his assignment as the Associate Administrator for all of Seminaries and Institutes, that alone should give you pause to think this guy, he probably knows what he's talking about. Those of us that have worked with him can verify that. This, this comes from great wisdom. Um, I'd like to just jump through a, a few different places. If you'll follow along with me, we've, we've numbered the paragraphs for ease of reference on this. And as he begins, he reminds us of a talk in paragraph three that Brother Webb gave a few years ago, where he asked us to, to consider a few questions as we teach. And um, he now is going to add upon that. Um, in particular, if you'll jump down to, ver to paragraph five, with me, um, and about halfway down through that, after he says thank you, this is where his thesis statement comes. Do you have that, Brother Bangor? Yep. Would you read that after thank you, just that last part? <clears throat> thank you. Today we, today we may talk for a moment about the role the scriptures play. Oh, sorry. May we talk for a moment about the role the scriptures play in our preparation to teach? The role the scriptures play in our preparation to teach. That's, that's the, the real point, the real message behind all of this that we're going to be looking at. And so beginning in the sixth paragraph, as he starts to develop this idea, the role that the scriptures play in our preparation. Um, I'd like you to look at paragraph six, and as we read that, I want you looking for a statement of principle. He's going to share a scripture, he's going to give you a little context, and then he's going to share this scripture with you. And... Um, you bet. And I'd like you to look for, the, for a statement of principle. Gentry, I'm going to have you read paragraph 6, okay? Okay. In May of 1829, Joseph and Emma Smith were living in Harmony, Pennsylvania. Hiram Smith had come to visit and hoped, come to, visit and hoped to learn about, the role, about his role in, in the unfolding restoration. The prophet inquired of the Lord and was, quick, <clears throat> was reminded that the word is quick and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword. The Savior then taught Hiram and us a principle and a priority as he set in place an important sequence for teachers. Seek not to declare my word, but first seek to obtain my word, and then shall your tongue be loose. Then, if you desire, you shall have my spirit and my word, yea, the power of God, unto the convincing of men. Okay, take that scripture that he's shared, and will you find in that a statement of principle we're going to put on the board... To, to guide and to, to, to recall as we move through the rest of this talk. How would you summarize that into a, into a statement of principle? You don't have to rewrite scripture, typically, ever, but um, we are going to write this in a way that's, that's kind of clear for our understanding, as clear as possible, so yes. As I try to, as I try to understand the Word of God, I'll have the spirit along with that understanding. Good. Look for all the ifs and all of the thens. This, you know, we, we, we teach you in 471 that your statements of principle should be clear, complete, succinct, right, simple. I'm okay if we, if this one stretches out a little bit because that, it seems like there are several qualifiers and several promises in there. And so keep looking through that. Now say yours one more time. If we seek understanding, then we'll have it, then we'll have the spirit along with that understanding. Good. Would you add anything to that? Will you start that up on the board for us, and maybe we'll, we'll edit that a little bit on the fly? Go ahead, Gentry. I was just going to say, because he said, and now I'm forgetting, if we seek something, but... Seek I would, understanding. Yeah, but I, think I would add from the scriptures, just from his statement, like, first the word, not just any understanding. Yeah. But, Scriptural understanding, right? In fact, let's let's take. Let, let, go ahead and you put it as you were putting it. We may do little arrows. It's going to get sloppy. That's all right. 
he's used the word understanding in place of what scriptural word? Look back at the verse. What, what word is to obtain. To obtain. obtain? Do you feel that understanding captures obtain? Is there anything else to it? Yes. I think there's more to it. I think obtain means that it's yours, that you own it, that you love it, that you live it, that you feel it, that it's not just something that you understand with your mind, but something you feel with your heart. It's yours. So if you were to add to our statement so far, in addition to understanding the Word of God, we're talking about, can you give it, can we, can we tidy that up a little bit? But internalize. Internalize. Did you see him We could do that as a team. Obtain. If we do, we have to do it based on an assumption or a promise that we all get what we really mean by obtain. It's like it's like when you take a, a, a beach ball and you deflate the beach ball so you can send it to somebody else, and then they get it out of the mail and they're like, <clears throat> right? It's no fun unless they reinflate the beach ball. Obtain. We have to. If we've condensed it down to that word, we've got to all agree that there's more to it. There's, there's meaning behind it. By obtain, we mean understand it, internalize it, and the fire is burning. Do you agree? It's not just that you get it. It's, it's, it's just in me, internalized. Okay? So if we seek to obtain, colon, to understand... And internalize, sorry, my handwriting, internalize. Are we okay on the if part? Okay, then let's go to the then part. I like the end of it. I, I agree with like, you will have the spirit with you, but it, it, it clarifies what it means to have the spirit with you and your tongue being loose. He says, yay the power of God to teach. I think that's cool. It's like, this is what will happen if you obtain my word. You'll have the spirit. You've already added a different one, too. What, what uh, is it? Tongue will be loosed, your mouth will be open, right? You'll be able to. Mouth will be filled. In fact, yeah. we can almost make a bullet list. We will have the spirit. Our tongue will be loosed. What, what does that mean? If we, if we had to qualify obtain, we'd probably better qualify a tongue being loosed. Like, our, our mouths will be filled. Like, we'll know how to convey things. I don't know. How to I think speak out what to say. To teach. Could we? Could we say we will speak according to the Spirit instead of just have it? Because we have it through baptism and confirmation. And worthiness, right? And worthiness. Does it say this? Or are you saying... That's what that you're saying? Both yeah. of them. Okay. That our words will be guided by the Spirit, and that after we say them, because they will come out of our mouth, they will be confirmed as true. You two are pow wowing. What did you get? Clarity, because like, I think that you'll have the Spirit, but not only is like, it has to be clear. So our tongues will be loose means I think that it would be clear to them and to us so that the hearer and the learner can both be up with it. But that comes with like clarity. We will teach simply and powerfully. Let's see relevancy with that. Mm -hmm. With the clarity. With clarity with what? Relevancy. Relevancy. It seems like you sister said a different one too. I was powerfully, simply and powerfully. Have we added? Have we have we added to the words of Scripture, or is this in there? Do you feel like you're comfortable that what we've listed is in there? Yes. I think sort of another thing that goes along with your tongue will be loose is is courage, because sometimes we're a little bit shy, sometimes we're a little bit reserved in our testimonies. Okay. And do you believe you're saying that? I agree with that. Is that in this text? I mean, he doesn't use the word courage, but do you feel that that's implied by talking about having the spirit, for example, and teaching with boldness? I think so. Let me ask. Let me ask you to look at one more thing because we don't have in, we don't have you know unlimited amounts of time to look at this. We've only been introducing it so far. The last phrase in there, unto the convincing of men. What does that mean to you? What is he saying? What's the promise there? Yeah. Um, it's, is it Jace? 
No, it's Landon. Landon, oh, sorry. I think there's an O in I just think of like the end result is to convert the hearts of those who are listening. And so when I think of convince me convincing them is to convince them of Christ, to convince them to come to Christ. Um, so, you know, you'll teach with power. Um, with you'll, be, you'll teach with not just power, but with converting power. So okay. that people will <clears throat> want to come to Christ. I love it, <clears throat> brother. Did you have your hands up too? Yeah, I was going to say the same thing because the footnotes of that scripture convince us, converts us. Convert. Okay, and Emily? Um, I was just thinking, like, what does convince mean to me? And I think that when I'm convinced of something, I'm not doubting. And so to leave it in the hearts of those that we teach that they're not doubting the principles that they're learning. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so... So I sound a little bit like an infomercial at this point, but be patient with me on that. You look at this, and you have to want that for your students. I, I can't imagine you doing what you do and working as hard as you work, and that's not a desired outcome for you, right? Of course that's what you want. Sister Carr. I'm sorry, this is a jot and a tittle, but with this group, it's not an if, it's a when. Yes, I agree with that. I agree with that. But you came here wanting to know, if that's what you want, you came here wanting to know how. Right? I do believe it's a win, but I also believe it won't be if you don't know how. And so, we want it, how do we do it? How do we really obtain it? How do we get understanding and internalize it? That's his point of this talk. That's my introduction to try to send you on your study of this talk. He'll tell you how. <clears throat> And it, in the process, it's helped you understand the relationship that I think Brother Martin also modeled really well for our new teachers a week or so ago about the relationship between our text, our source, the scriptures, and the resource of the curriculum and how those two should be appropriately used. Just skim with me for a couple of minutes, okay? If you'll turn the page over... And you'll look beginning in paragraph 12, the hierarchy of truth. He introduces in paragraphs 9 through 11, he said, I'm going to tell you how to do this basically by giving you two recommendations. One, that you understand that there is a hierarchy to truth, and there's an explanation behind that. And second, he says, for you to, to, to see that there are connections, patterns, and themes, and how that helps you in your preparation as you study. And he's even going to give you kind of a, a flow chart to follow in your preparation. But again, I think Brother Martin modeled for us. In paragraph 12, he quotes Elder Maxwell about the aristocracy among truths. And that, in, verse, in paragraph 13, something can be true, but it can also be unimportant. For example, the color of suit I'm wearing. Right? Uh, Elder Maxwell used that as an example. He says, for example, today I'm wearing a brown suit. It's true, it's just not very important. And, and he said, that last word, I had to look that up, that's a Maxwellianism. The filthy means it's like the, the, the serf, his sworn loyalty to the, the feudal owner, the master, the governor. And so he said, there are certain truths that are so important, we have a sworn allegiance to teach them. That's what he's saying there. So down in paragraph 16, beginning there. Will you write this in your margins for your own study as you go back home? Look for the balance he teaches in preparing, as you prepare to teach, in learning and obtaining an understanding of the details and the doctrine. For those of you that are back for a second semester, you've heard in 471 and from your pre-service trainers an emphasis that you teach principle in scripture. Brother Howell, as he's come for visits, has given the balance that you see in here. He's come and he said, now listen, don't teach principles. Well, of course, he's not, he's not saying don't ever teach principles. The scriptures exist for the purpose of teaching principles. He's teaching the same balance that Brother Haas is teaching here about ensuring that you have both mastered the storyline and what's taking place there, as well as the doctrine that's involved. So what I'm asking you to do is, next to paragraph 16, write, look for the balance between teaching the story and the principle. And you'll find that in paragraphs 16 through 19, 20, in that area there. 
But as a kind of a summary statement, will you look at paragraph 21 with me? Stephen, would you read the last half of paragraph 21, beginning with, if we teach? If we teach every detail of history and the law, and if we teach every element of Israel's wanderings, and we miss the message of Heavenly Father's plan, and the Savior's atonement in the Old Testament, we will not have taught the message of the Old Testament. Right, and so, but back in paragraph 17, he's going to say, I've heard of devotional teaching where it's all about the principles. Where we like read a verse and we're like, okay, now let's talk for 40 minutes about this doctrine. And, and he said that misses the mark as well. And so he's going to teach it about it a little bit in there. Um, finally, I, I'm, I'm out of time, so I'm just going to have you look at one other thing with me. Beginning in paragraph 24, beginning in paragraph 24, he is going to recommend to you four things you do before you open the curriculum in your lesson preparation. Four things you do before you open the curriculum. If you'll notice, in paragraph 29, he says, after studying in this way, when we do turn to the curriculum, right, that sentence, that statement implies that paragraphs 24 through 28 have taken place before we turn to the curriculum. Now, when we're... Brother Martin wisely taught you, uh, those that are our new teachers, that when you're teaching a large block of scripture, sometimes the curriculum is going to need to be opened earlier on for you to be able to see at least where the emphasis is. But it doesn't change those, those four steps that he's going to recommend here, even in a large block of scripture. Once you kind of see where the emphasis has been placed by curriculum writers, you go to those places and do these things. Really what it is, it's not necessarily steps you take, it's the lens or the filter by which you read the text. Look for this, look for this, look for this, look for this. Now I know in, in the time that we have today, I, I knew we wouldn't be able to fully digest this talk. It took him longer than 20 minutes to give it. The idea in all of this was to say, you want this. The only way to this is this. And he, with great wisdom and clarity in this talk, addresses how this can happen. It, was, it is a very powerful talk in that regard. And so I would challenge you, if you feel like you're ever beating your head against the wall, trying to make your lesson preparation more effective in the time that you have. We were just talking about this yesterday, right? What to do in the time that we have. If, if, you're, if you feel like you're beating your head against the wall, please take the time to read this talk. Um, paragraph 49, then I'm done. Throughout your classes and even in your homes and families, will you please take the time to ask your students and children what they are learning and how it helps them understand and rely on Heavenly Father and the Savior? This is as he's talking about types and shadows and how they help us to accomplish what we want to do and so they should guide us in how we prepare lessons. Um, I've seen in your classes several times as I've come for visits, as you've, written, you've asked a super important, wonderful, significant question, you've put up on the board the question, where have you seen the Savior in the Old Testament? I've seen it in several of your classes. It's a wonderful question. And I invite you to add to that another question. What are you, what are you learning about Jesus Christ from those episodes? Lectures on Faith says that's why those stories exist. It's not just that you say, I saw Jesus in the manna. I saw him in the brass serpent. I saw him in the such and such. Well, what did you learn about his attributes and his character and his perfections through those episodes? Add that question. Not just, it's not where's Waldo. It's not where is he. It's what do I learn that helps increase my faith in him and seek to become more like him. As he concludes this talk, he asks you several questions to consider as you're about to take the lesson you've prepared and walk into a classroom with it. Paragraphs 54 to 58. The last thing I point out to you, this talk is 60 paragraphs long. The footnotes include 100 items. And several of those footnotes contain more than one item. When he talks about obtaining the word, he models it. He has digested the words of prophets, ancient and modern, and brings them to bear to help us understand it. I commend it to your study. I, I hope that you'll, you'll pay the price in this talk, as he teaches you how to pay the price to get this, 
that you might witness that. I, I love this work. This is, it's fun, it's fulfilling, and I hope already this semester you've seen the impact that your teaching has. I love it, and I love you for doing it, and I say that in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Thank you, good friend. We have some new student teachers with us. We want to take just a minute and make sure they know you and you know them. So, Chanchi, will you go ahead? Simple little 30-second introduction. Everything we should know about Gentry Francis. If you leave anything out, I'll fill it in, okay? <laughs> and then we'll go with Elise and Nick and Jason and Emily and Landon. And you'll probably just take 10 seconds to introduce yourself. Skyler, Chad, you do the same. And a quick introduction and so forth. Okay, go. Okay. Um, I'm Gentry. Um, Franson from Sandy, Utah, and I'm currently at BYU, and I graduate in April, um, and I'm a family life major, which is a blast, so that's 30 seconds. And you're getting married. I'm currently dating. <laughs> Seriously. I'm not engaged, so I can't say that yet. <laughs> so that's <laughs> okay. okay. Hey, I'm Elise Allman. I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I'm studying health education, so I'm student teaching health right now and center. And I like to play basketball. Yeah. All right. Nick. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I'm Nick Baker. Um, I've got two really cool boys. I grew up in Highland, and I'm living in Midvale. I'm teaching a class at Pinogas. Just quickly, in your prior life, tell them what you did. Um, I worked for a wilderness therapy program where we would go into the wilderness. Um, they'd be out there for like three or more months, and I'd go spend... At risk youth? What? At risk youth. Yeah. Yeah, I'd spend a week out there at a time, eight days, and I'd be home for six and spend eight days out. Did you write that in What? Did you write that No, my major is Okay. Should I stand right here? <laughs> sure. Uh, I'm Jason Hansen. Um, I'm a linguistic student at BYU. I'm working on a lot of cool things trying to... I'm trying to analyze the Utah dialect, because it's really cool. I moved around a lot, so that's why... I, and I hear a bunch of different Englishes from different places, so that's why I'm so interested in I'm in Utah, and it's pretty great. Am I leaving anything out? Utah doesn't even don't have a dialect. Ask <laughs> <laughs> our, our Georgia girl. Do <laughs> Utahns have a dialect? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> we go to the house of the Lord. <laughs> so our if you're from southern Utah. St. George. We grow corn out in the field. Skyler? So I'm Skyler Wilcox from Logan, Utah. I'm at BYU studying broadcast journalism and teaching over at Provo High School right now. So. Zach? Zach Hickson, Springville, Utah, teaching at Maple Mountain. I graduated from there, and Brother Martin saved my life spiritually there. <laughs> <laughs> you told me he's removed his tattoo as nearing. His face tattoo, the spider web he had on his face. <laughs> it's gone. It's gone. It's gone. He's way better looking. My wife thinks you're fine. Yeah. <laughs> Can you stand or? You're fine. Okay. Uh, Landon Perry from Central Utah. Uh, lived in Utah all my life. Uh, married, have a little boy. Uh, graduated from BYU in rec management. Um, Love to play tennis. Always playing tennis, love to sing. Um, I'm teaching at Westlake High School right now, um, and I just really started, so I just graduated as well. So, um, did, did I hear in a conversation that you were in singing group? I was in singing group. <laughs> oh, that's it. A vocal point. You were in vocal. Mm -hmm. I think we need a concert. You, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> just get the real vocal point to come, because I'm not part of it anymore. <laughs> well, I pull some strings. But voice line is a uh, vocal group for UVU, okay. similar. <clears throat> I'm Emily Estrada. I'm teaching at Spanish Fork High School right now. I'm at BYU studying Latin American studies, so we get to study all about Latin America. It's great. Can you speak fluent Spanish? Yes. 
Steve Anderson just graduated from NYU in psychology, and I thought I recognized you. In that I had a familiar thing. <laughs> you work at the MTC? I worked there for four years. Okay, that's where. But anyway, um, yeah, teaching at Maser Academy. Right. Chad? Chad, you do have to stand. I do have to stand. Yeah. I was going to hide. So I'm Chad Johnson. I'm from American Fork. I just graduated from NYU in family life, so there's that. Uh, and I'm married and have a uh, two-year-old little girl, and then next week we'll find out the gender of our second baby. Oh. So there's that. And I'm teaching at uh, Mountain Ridge and Mountain Villa Academy. When you say just graduated, you mean December? Yes. Both also talking. I am Lynn Steele. I am at BYU studying business finance. I am teaching at Tipview right now. Just came from Provo before. Um, I'm taking a skiing class. I'm going to tell you that I love to ski, but I'm falling down a lot on mountain right now. So. <laughs> Talk to me in a month or so, and I'll let you know how it goes. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm Parker Marsden from Bountiful. Um, I am in my last semester at BYU studying Spanish, so I don't know Spanish. Estoy leyendo Don Quixote. Super long, it's like 400 pages. Um, but I'm at Provo, so <laughs> teaching me. Great, so glad you're here. Love being with you. Uh, a group of third grade children in Salem, Oregon, were asked to complete the proverb. They were given the first part of the proverb, and they get to write the second half. For example, a bird in the hand, the kid wrote, is a really dead bird. <laughs> Ask me no questions, and sit down and shut up. <laughs> These are actually kids. If you can't stand the heat, Take a cold shot. <laughs> a rolling stone? It would be what? Yeah, a rolling stone is a weird singer. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, Rome wasn't built in my neighborhood. <laughs> okay, your turn. You have a post it. Complete this sentence. I'm going to read it, and you complete it. And I'm quoting a fairly impressive book, but I'm not telling you the page, so you can't peek. There are few things a teacher can do that will have a more powerful effect on the lives of his students than... Go. There are few things a teacher can do that will have a more powerful effect in the lives of his students, then based on the fact that some of you have been with us almost a year, uh, some of you have just joined us but spent two consecutive Fridays together, you're going, this is not fair, right? <laughs> uh, the right answer is, Parker? Um, I put helping them study their scriptures personally. You said? Teaching the word of God by the Spirit. You said? I'm coming to Christ. You said? I'm going to love the Savior. You said? Helping them have experiences with the Savior. Jason? Loving God. Teaching them the scriptures. Pointing them to the Savior. Yeah. See? You're going. See, this isn't like that third grade exercise, okay? Um, where, wow, we're looking for the right answer. All of those are correct. I'd like to take my few minutes that I have to focus on a sentence on page 20 of your Gospel Teaching and Learning Handbook. And I invite you to find President Ezra Taft Benson and notice how amazing things work. Uh, look at Brother Hunt, well, what Brother Hunt taught us right there from President Ezra Taft Benson. Can you see it? Page 20, uh, Searstone People 231, 2.3.1. Uh, Elise, would you take President Benson first? Before you can. Before you can strengthen your students, it is essential that you study the doctrines of the kingdom and learn the gospel by both study and faith. That's exactly what our dear friend Brother Hunt just taught you. So my, my sentence is right next to that. There are a few. Nick, take it. There are a few things teachers can do that will have a more powerful and long-lasting influence for good in the lives of their students than helping them learn to love the scriptures and to study them on a daily basis. Okay, 
I would like to edit this sentence because I, I think it's saying the same thing, but it sure makes it more clear. There are a few things teachers can do that will have a more powerful and long-lasting influence for good in the lives of their students than, one, helping them learn to love the scriptures. Now, isn't that interesting? How many of you mentioned that? And two, helping them, I think that's missing, to study the scriptures then on a daily basis as a bonus. So if I were to ask you this question, do your students know how to study scripture? Where did they learn it? Tell me how they, they learned to study scripture. Talk to me. <clears throat> My time's short, sure. talk. Go, go, go. Their parents' example. Huh? Their parents' example. Okay, and it, it could have been, could have been bad. Right? For example, in our home, we read the script. That's great. What else do you do? Nothing. We just read them, okay? Where else did you learn scripture study? Sunday school, primary. Sunday school, Sunday. primary, right? And you typically adopted the model of whoever the teacher was. Isn't that fair to say? How'd your mission help you with scripture study? Did your mission president ever teach you how to study scripture? Okay. Well, it's really, really helpful when Elder Scott tells you how to do it. Okay? Elder Scott knows a little bit about Scripture study, as does Elder Maxwell and Elder McConkie, and it's interesting, you bet, if we took, um, if we were to make a, a composite of everything they said, it would really be this, first and second. Jason, take first. Here we go. From Elder Scott. Right above that, three paragraphs above what we were just reading. First, walk with your students step by step through many passages of the sacred word of the Lord. Okay, tell me about the word through. As opposed to? Skim over. Skim, skip, around, right? Go through the verses. All right, next, go. Help them feel your enthusiasm, respect, and love for the scriptures. Which you will never have unless you've done what Brother Hunt taught us so well. <laughs> once you have, once you've paid that price, wow, you're just, you're on fire. He used the word, Brother Haas used the word in his talk, you will be on fire. You can't hardly wait for Clut the Bell to read, okay? And second, Zach, help them learn to read. Stop, harder. that's all you need. You and I need to help our students know how to read and study scripture. They don't know how. They may have one or two little family Hence, we always mark the main character. That's great. We read slow. We read fast. And so one of the things that I'm suggesting to you, and Brother Hal gave us this a couple years ago. This is kind of like Wheel of Fortune because you get certain consonants in a vowel. The first ten come right out of your handbook. For example, number one, study aids. Where did I come up with that one? Look right here. Study aids. Turn the page. Mark and annotate. Can you see it? Ponder and visualize. Keep, the first ten are word for word out of your gospel teaching and learning. And then I threw on eleven, I, number 11 some others. For the next few minutes, here is what I would like to do. Aside from students, we're just doing this in our own personal preparation. Brother Hunt's talking about, boy, filling the reservoir, getting ready to teach. Because if you're doing this in your personal study, it is so easy to just transfer it into your teaching, okay? So let's take the first one. Go with me to Isaiah chapter 1. If you, You'll need hard copy scriptures because I'm going to be going 100 miles an hour, okay? Do all of you have hard copy scriptures? You don't? Uh, I know there's some. Right underneath the... Right here. All right. Isaiah chapter 1. Verses 5 and 6. Simply read them to yourself. This is Isaiah. Okay. Isaiah chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. Truly, honestly, how many of you are saying to yourself right now, I know exactly what that means. <laughs> now watch how simple. Turn back one page and read the first sentence of your chapter head. What is he describing? 
He's talking about Israel. So the body he is talking about is what? Talk to me. Come on. It's the house of Israel. Okay. They are apostate, rebellious, and corrupt. They're sick from their head to their foot. They're full of bruises and wounds and tumors. And it won't matter how much ointment you put on the children of Israel, they are sick. Now, can you see why I used a chapter heading? Simple little thing. Okay, while you're there in Isaiah, look at chapter 2, verse 3. You ready? Landon, you read, and I'm just we're just I'm gonna interrupt you a whole bunch of times. Here we go. Isaiah 2 3. 2 3. And it shall come to pass in the last days the mountain of the Lord's house should be established. That that two and three? Did I say three? Just three. Okay. The house should be established on top of the mountains. Are you two three? Chapter 2, verse 3. And many people shall go and say... Pause. Circle the A. When? When's this going to happen? Millennium. Or a few years as we are what? Preparing. Preparing for it. Go. Come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. And to the house of the Circle God the C. Jacob. What's the house of the God of Jacob? The temple. Great. The temple. Go ahead. And he will teach us. How are we going to teach ways. the world his ways? Footnote. Keep going. And we will walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the law. Footnote. What's Zion? The kingdom of God. It's the kingdom of God on the earth. It's the church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints. Go. Shall go forth the law and the word. What's of the, the law? Footnote. Doctrine. And of who? Of who? Read it. Read your footnote. Of who? Oh, God. Through Latter-day Saints. the Latter-day Saints. Go. And the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Verse 4. And he shall judge. Who's he? Jesus. When? Millennium. Now, uh, enough said. Simple, powerful little introductory to a sick body with a chapter heading. Mm -hmm. I have no idea what he's talking about, and I picked one you probably did know what he was talking about. Uh, for example, let's go to Ezra. Oh, we haven't got time. If, if, if we had, you're saying, um, how many of you have taught, no, nobody's taught Ezra yet, okay? How many of you are just thrilled about teaching Ezra? You have got Ezra down pat. <laughs> okay? Here's what I want you to do. <laughs> oh, you do? No. Martin, Martin does. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Go to the book of Ezra, which is right after after the Chronicles. Chronicles, Chronicles, Ezra. Okay. All I want you to do is read simply the first heading. Ezra chapter 1. You done? 9... 10, there's 10 seconds. Tell me what you know about this book. Go. Do it. King Cyrus. Who's King Cyrus? Uh, he allowed the Jews to go No, back. who is he? King of Persia. How do you know he's the king of Persia? He's in the head. What's going to happen? He's going to allow the Jews to go back and build the temple. Where have we been? We've been in Babylon. Why? Because Jerusalem was destroyed. Oh, the Jews where's all that? It's all in the head. <clears throat> Boy, don't miss those. I've never heard of the, king, the, the uh, kingdom of Persia. Use your Bible maps, and you have on map 7 a map of the kingdom of Persia. Okay? Oh, man, the Bible helps. You know all about Mark and Annotate. Mark that. Note that. Circle that word. Underline that phrase. Turn your scriptures on its side and write the prophet Samuel. I don't need to model that one. Go with me to 1 Samuel 28. 1 Samuel 28. This one's called Ponder and Visualize. 1 Samuel chapter 28, verse 6. 1 Samuel 28, 6. Page? Okay, now, are you doing this with your students? Can you do this with your students? Oh, yeah. But where did it start? You started with you. You're doing this. So all I'm, all I'm going to ask you to do is read three verses, six, seven, eight. You watching? Paint a picture. Tell me what this picture looks like. Go. Oh, 
What's going on here? Talk to just paint me a picture, Landon. So Saul sees the field signs coming up. He's scared, and so he goes to the Lord asking for help, but he doesn't hear anything. Why well, can't he get anything from the Lord? In fact, he can't get anything from the Lord, nor from his dreams, nor what? I read the Urim and What circle that C? What what's the Urim? I might have heard of that before. <laughs> circle, what is it? The Urim and Look right here, what I just did. I helped you with an important word or phrase, didn't I? Mm -hmm. Okay. Who's the woman? A witch. How did you know she's a witch? She said it. Put also the chapter heading. Notice what you did. We just got a synonym for the word woman. Where? So tell me the story. Now that you know those two things, those simple two things, paint the story, Zach. Give me a picture. Uh, Star Wars. <laughs> Called Endor. <laughs> Thank you for the pity laugh. Um, so. Saul, he's having struggles. He can't receive revelation from Why? God. Why can't people get revelation? Because he's not following God's commandments. Great. He goes to a wrong source. He goes to someone with a familiar spirit, this witch. I want you to look really carefully at verse 8 and tell me what he does before he goes into the witch. Why would he do that? Because he's wrong with the sea because he's the he's key. It's supposed to be a right to take it. You know that's wrong. He knows he's wicked. He's embarrassed. He's the king. And he's getting revelation now from who? Which, look right here. Are you getting a picture? Are you getting a visualization in your mind? Did I help you with a synonym? What was it? The woman is the witch. What phrase did I help you with? Uh, why did the Lord use the word disguised? I just asked you that question. Why did the Lord use that word or phrase? Okay, just flip two more chapters to chapter 31. Identifying pronouns. Kids have no clue who the he, it, them, they is. Okay? So I want you to read with me, uh, starting in verse 8. Okay? Came to pass, 1 Samuel chapter 31, verse 8. Came to pass, and on the morrow, when the Philistines came to strip the slain. Help me with that phrase. Take away their goods. Take the booty, right? Take everything that's left. That they, who's they? Found Saul and his, whose sons? Saul's. Fallen in the mound of Jeboah. And they cut off his head. Who's? Saul's. Really? The great king Saul? And stripped off his, whose armor? Saul's. And sent it to the land of the Philistines round about to publish it. What's the it? The news. There you go. We killed Saul. And then they do something that no one would ever possibly think of with a human headless body. Tell me what they did. They hung it up to the wall of Bethshem. Their trophy. Can you see why your students and you need to know the they, his, it, then, they, see, you, they ha you have to help them with pronouns, word repetition, you did this today, so you come teach it. Come on. 1 Samuel chapter 8. Oh, yeah. 1 Samuel chapter 8, you ready? When you see word repetitions, you can't, you just can't skip them in your personal study, nor in your teaching. Go. So 1 Samuel chapter 8, starting in verse 10. Samuel's warning the people what it will be like when they have a king. I can almost see him. He, he like leans forward a little bit. He said, okay, you want a king? You're rejecting God? This is what will happen to you. Look at verse 11. He will take your sons. He will set them to plant his ground. He will set them to harvest the, his crops. He will make them his warriors. He will take your daughters, verse 13. Verse 14, he will take your fields. Can you see the repetition? Mm -hmm. he will, you, you have got to see that in your preparation so that you can do what he's doing in class today, just nailing them. He will, he will, he will, and then 
Man, it adds power to the verse, okay? Well done, thanks. Thank so, any repetition, look for it. Absolutes, go to 1 Samuel 17, verse 6. Sometimes when the Lord speaks, you need to point out to your students and in your personal study that some things are not, well, this could be, it might be, there's a chance. No, there are some absolutes. Wickedness, help me. Isn't it interesting? He didn't say wickedness can often lead to unhappiness, right? It's an absolute. Find the absolute in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 6. Absolute. I gave you the wrong verse. He had us. Absolutely. Where is it? It's 18. Is it 18? Oh, way to go, Rich. 17.6. Did I say 17.6? Oh, sugar. Okay. Uh, hang on, hang on. I'll find it. Do you, do you mean 16.7 by chance? No, I mean this one right here. I mean 17, verse 46. 46. Give me the absolutes. Mr. Goliath, sir, I, you know, I don't want to hurt you, but you may lose. No. Fire. I will smite thee. I will kill you. <laughs> the Lord will deliver. The Lord is going to allow it to happen. This day. Today, I'm going to do what? I'm going to deliver Israel. And today, I'm also going to do what? Give the carcasses to the fowls. And today, I'm going to do what with my sword? Cut off your I'm cutting head. your head off. Boy, you have to see absolutes. Does that make sense? So here we go. All I've done is just tried to show you a few. Um, go to Psalms, chapter 1. Psalms is really, what's the best name for the book of Psalms? Hymn. The Old Testament hymn book, right? So literally, you have a whole bunch of hymns. It would be really fun to invite students to do teach you one of them. Pick 5 or 10 or 15 of the best. All I want you to do, if the, if the Psalms are a hymn book, okay, I want you to read verse 1, 2, and 3. And I want you to find a phrase where you see you, the Lord is speaking directly to you. Spencer, good to see you, brother. Find, is it verse 1 of the song? Is it verse 2 of the song? Or verse 3 of the song? Where are you going? He's talking right to me. What phrase did you read and you're going, he's talking to me? Chad? This is in Psalms 1. Which verse? Oh, so in verse 2. Uh, I just like the phrase, his delight is in the law. How often? In verse 2. Oh. How often yeah. do you think about the Savior and his church and his gospel? Oh. And okay. what's your verse, Lynn? Uh, I was looking and just the top part, blessed is the man that walketh not in counsel of the ungodly. And then, all I'm doing again on your list right here, find a verse that speaks to you. There's another scripture study method. Make a list. You have done that. Um, go to First Samuel seven. 1 Samuel chapter 7, we did this in the model last Friday. Um, this is a list, and if you look at number 10, first bullet, it's also scriptural math. If you look at chapter 7, we tried the ark, we tried to fight alone, that didn't work. We tried to drag the ark into the war, that didn't work. So Samuel says, look. Let's try another option. Emily Dahl, here we go. Verse 3. As Emily reads this for us, I want you to find the math formula. Will you please? Here we go. 7-3. Uh-huh. Then Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel, saying, If you do not return the Lord with all your hearts, then... Okay, here's our first one. We are going to what? Return with all your hearts. Mark it. Plus, out your margin, plus... Put away the strange gods. Meaning... Wickedness. Throw out your wickedness. Okay. Throw out your idols. Okay. 
plus and prepare your hearts unto the Lord plus and serve him only equals he will deliver you out of the land of see math equations math, the scriptures are full of them did we just make a math equation or a list yes okay yeah. uh, you know all about uh, cause and effect if then watch really carefully Elder Packer says the word that answers the why question. I speak unto you that. What's coming? The why. And he said we need to teach our teenagers the why. So here you go. There's your block. And I've given it to you really quickly. Scan that really quickly and pick any of the methods we just talked about and pick one for the lesson that you're going to teach on 1 Kings 17, 8 through 16. Just simply tell me which of those scripture study methods could be incorporated. In fact, is it okay? Can, let's just do it together because I only got two minutes. Um, First Kings, Second Kings, right? First Kings 17, okay. Starting in verse 8. Uh, we need a reader. Uh, Lynn, are you there at all? And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to... Whoa, 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 whoa. You're, wasted, you're so fast. i got to get you. Sorry. <laughs> 17. Okay, hang on. 1 Kings 17, starting in verse... Oh, no wonder I'm in 2 Kings. Sorry. 1 Kings chapter... 17. <laughs> now you wonder why kids get confused, right? All right. Here we go. Here we go. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying... Who's him? There's your pronouns. See that? Who's him? Elijah. Elijah. Write it in. I'll spell you his name. It's right here. Go ahead. Then. Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Wow, I have no idea where those are. In my study, what am I going to do? I'm going to look them up on a map, and guess what? They're not on either map, so you'll have to Google it. All right? But you'll be able to say, here's the Dead Sea. Here's the, here's the Sea of Galilee, and it's on the east side of the Jordan River, about halfway between the two. Okay, here we go. Um, behold, I have commanded a, wo a widow woman there to sustain thee. So he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering his sticks. And he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. Tell me, any of these things you're going to have to do to make this story work for your kids? Yep. Tell me another one. Fetch. Do they know that word? They know the word fletch, but they don't know the word fetch, right? Okay. Uh, what do you know about the widow woman? Verse 11, go. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her. And Who's said, she? The widow. And said, bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thy hand. Who said this? Elijah. You have to know that. you got to help your students. Go. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a, cru in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks, that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, Pause. that you may eat it. You have to. You have to, right there, do what? Define cruise. Whether you define cruise or not. What did you just see? And this is right where Brother Mark's going to pick up. Tell me what is going on. How many sticks? Two, two. How much fire can you build with two sticks? No. Why? Why she only need a little fire, Stephen? Well, she's incredibly poor. She has hardly anything. That will heat the food I have. I'm going to eat it and what? You have to visualize that. See what I'm saying to you? You have to help them see that, feel that, understand that. Now, if you've done that in your preparation, then you're just as anxious and excited as I am right now to say, can you see this picture? Knowing it, knowing women the way you know women, who's she most worried about? Now we've got a whole different vision. You know who's going to get that food. See, just a suggestion. Um, the most important thing among the many things we could do to help our students Help them study the scripture. And there's a template that might be helpful to you. Um, there's a big, 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 big difference between reading scripture and searching it. Which did the Savior command? 
search. Did we do that in the last 10 minutes? We weren't reading scripture. We were searching and digging and marking. I encourage you to try just a few of those. Don't try and get them all. But they all ought to be part of your preparation, and they can't. A handful of those a day goes a long, long way. I promise you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So I've learned a lot about the book of Ezra. <laughs> I've watched the uh, BYU discussions on it. Has anyone watched that, by the way? On it? Three times. It's my, my wife is still reading, so I can't go to sleep. TV that I watch. So uh, I've learned a couple things. Number one, remember how we had a question when Ezra comes, this is for those who were in the new uh, teacher training. When Ezra comes, he finds the temple built. When Ezra comes into Jerusalem and sees the temple, it's been built for 40 years. You remember we had that question? Yeah, like why he was going. Yeah, was so, and then the people are already going back to idolatry, and he's trying to help the people. But Ezra comes back. I also got a real clear picture in my mind. Babylonians conquer Jerusalem. The Persian king comes in, defeats the Babylonians. Now he's in control. And to win the hearts of the people, he's saying, not just to the Israelites, but to a bunch of different groups of people, go back to your towns. Worship the way you would like. Give me a really clear picture for what it would be like if you could imagine someone conquering Utah Valley, we can't worship the way we want, we can't do the things we want. 50 years later, someone else comes in and conquers the people who conquered us and says, you know what, Mormons? Build your temples again. Start worshiping the way you'd like. Could you imagine <laughs> the feeling of that? Yeah. So, and then, so they do that, they start worshiping, and then they start turning to some other things and that's when Ezra comes in in chapter 7 through 10 and says what are you guys doing uh, so anyway those are all the questions we had together as we were studying and, and I got that by searching those BYU discussions and now I'm like I love the book of Ezra I love it um, okay can you say the guy's name first try what's that can you say the guy's name first try Xerxes yeah. Artaxerxes. There you go. <laughs> they said Sorry, that a, a number of times on the BYU TV. <laughs> <laughs> there are two statements, brothers and sisters, that are found in the handbook, and Brother Robbins just hit on one of them. But as I've been going around now, you know, as a principal, you observe a lot of teachers as well. And so for five years observing, and then now I get to observe a lot more than I even did as a principal. And, I've been asking myself the question, why are some, have you ever wondered this, why are some lessons just so much more powerful than other lessons? Like you go in one day and you teach it, and your class just comes alive, and they're kind of on fire, and you're like, I have figured out teaching. And then you go in the next time, and you teach, and it's like, wah, wah, wah. You know? And there are a couple of factors that I really, really believe I'm starting to see in those lessons that really light our students on fire. And uh, Brother Robbins and, and Brother Hunt, you know, they don't know what I'm going to say, but I would be curious what they, what they have to say about that too. And this is what they are. There's two statements in the handbook. Okay, the first one is on page 24. And uh, it says this, under context and content, to understand their writings, who's there? The scriptures, the prophets who wrote the scriptures. To understand their writings, teachers and Second students... Second paragraph down. Oh, sorry, yeah, I didn't put that. Second paragraph down on page 24. Okay, do you see where we're at? Here, let me see. Okay, we are... Last two lines. Right here, last two lines. To understand under context, okay? See that right there? Okay, read it, Gentry. To understand their writings, teachers and students should mentally step into their world. What does that look like? To mentally step into the writer of the scripture's world. Tell me what that looks like. To mentally step into their world. 
<clears throat> Go ahead, Parker. I think not only do you know like the facts, but you try and dive into how they felt and you know, how do the Israelites feel when they see the Philistines coming with their huge army and like so you dive in not only to the the ancient world in terms of like the setting and stuff, but also into their minds and their hearts. Yeah. Keep reading. As much as possible, step into their world uh, as much as possible. As much as possible. You want, like, they're sitting there in the battle. They are sitting there in the moment. You're watching this widow gather sticks with a son and she's starving. And they're, they feel like they're sitting there watching it occur. Step into their world as much as possible. Okay, keep going. To see things as the writer saw them. Okay. The following are some examples. That's, that's great. Yeah. I, I share this example a lot, but I just really think it brought home to me. And I've shared it with some of you maybe even recently. But just so you could picture with me, Alma and Amulek. They preach the gospel. Think about how you felt about the people that you preached the gospel to. And those who oppose them, you know, chase away all the husbands. Alma and Amulek are tied up, and they light a fire. Just think of this moment. And they bring forth the women and children. And if they will not deny, throw them in a fire in front of Alma and Amulek. Can you imagine them seeing these mothers weep, looking at their children, children seeing other women and children thrown into the fire, probably pulling away, being forced by people to be thrown in there? Mothers, knowing what's just about to happen to their children. Landon, what do you what's uh, I just never thought, like, with the imagery you're putting for it, I never thought, but possibly I wonder if some of them are begging Alma and Amulek to deny it so their children will be saved. Like, I never thought about that before, mm -hmm. but I imagine some of those people might have been accusing her, begging them to stop. Do you think Alma and Amulek know who they are? Are they watching random people on YouTube? believers of God, so... Yeah. See, these things are shocking for us when they happen in our world today right now in the Middle East, right? And here's Alma, Alma and Amulek, and it's happening to the people they love and taught. Children and women. Now, how do you think Amulek... He turns to Alma. How do you think he says it? The way our students read it? <laughs> Which is, you gave it to me. Aren't we going to do something about this? <laughs> Does that make sense? Sometimes we let our students read scriptures in the class and not even think about what's really happening. So you tell me, not what are some things, some emotions behind what Amulek says to, to Alma? If you were him, how would you be feeling when you turn to Alma and say, aren't we going to do something about this? Yeah. I, think, I mean, he has to be frustrated at that point because it's like, do something! Yeah. Pain. Yeah. Anger. Deep sorrow. And in the midst of those emotions, Alma gives his answer that the Lord suffers the righteous to perish so, you know, that the wicked can be judged for what they do. Now, we have to let them see those things. Right? We, uh, just think of, I was with Chad yesterday. We were talking, right? Imagine the story... <clears throat> of Samuel and Eli. Really imagine it. Make them imagine it. Because here's this young boy who's sleeping and all of a sudden hears 
Samuel. And he goes where? To Eli. What? And Eli says what to him? I didn't say anything. He goes back to bed. What's he probably thinking the first time he goes back to bed? Yeah, I, was, I must have heard something in my sleep. And then he hears what? Samuel. Goes to Eli. What? Matt, Eli, go back to bed. I didn't call you. Now what's he thinking? Maybe I have voice in my head. Maybe Eli's messing with me. <laughs> You've done that to people, haven't you? <laughs> when I see kids, my students at Macy's, I'll often sit there and just go, Jacob. And watch him. You know, I don't know why. <laughs> then he hears the third time, Samuel. And he comes to Eli and says, are you calling me? And what does Eli say to him? Imagine hearing this as a teenage boy. What does Eli perceive? It's the Lord. It's the Lord talking to you. You're a teenager. Next time you hear that voice say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. If that happened to you, you go back to bed. What are you thinking when your head hits the pillow? Am I going to hear it? Am I going to hear it? Is he going to talk to me again? Is it really the Lord? What would the Lord want to do with me? And then he, can you imagine the moment? Samuel. How do you think Samuel says it back? Uh, speak, Lord. <laughs> do, are we really picturing this? What do you think? How do you think he says it back, Emily? I think with a lot of reverence. I think, because I think he's finally realizing that moment that, I mean, he heard it again, like you said, am I going to hear it again? And then he heard it. I think that's a huge confirmation to him that he's, has the ability to listen, and he's definitely listening now. And then he has an interview with the Lord. Do you see now if you go in and talk, let's see what the Lord says to him. It's going to feel a little bit differently than if you, okay, so three times, okay, once, go back to bed, you know. <laughs> if you really get them to picture the moment, now can you imagine how, how much would you be anticipating that interview? Like, sneaking up, you get it. You say, <laughs> If it was you, Gentry, and you've heard the voice three times, then finally someone tells you, a priesthood leader tells you, next time you hear it, I think it's the Lord. I want you to say, speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. And you say, speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth, and now he's going to talk to you. Would you be listening to that message? So have them step into that world. The other is on page 28 under understand the principle. Okay? Understand the principle. Page 28. And it's, it's halfway through. It starts out when a teacher or a student. Will you read that? When a teacher or a student understands a doctrine or principle, they not only know what the words mean, but also how the doctrine or principle can affect their lives. Once a doctrine or principle is identified and understood, it can be more readily applied. Okay. So we have, do you see the common thread here? You want to take a principle now, and what do you want to talk to the students about? Their own lives. Their own lives. What does this really mean to them? What does it really look like? Does it matter at all to them? Get past the superficial gravity answers that we've talked about before. What does it really matter to them? How can it affect their life? If we aren't talking about that stuff, they aren't really feeling anything. If, we're, if it's all hypothetical or superficial, I don't know if they're really going to be energized to live it, to love it, and to put it in their lives. 
And so those two things, first you step into the past. It, it's almost like as a teacher, you stand here. And you need to help your students step into the past and really see what's going on in the scriptures. And then you need to help take the principle and step it into their lives. Their personal lives. As Brother Robin says, not, not in a forceful way or get in their face a little bit. Make them really confront these things and think about what that means to me. Am I doing that? Do I have that problem? Do I, can I hear the voice of the Lord? What do I need to hear the voice of the Lord about right now? If you ever sense that your students are just giving answers to get it over with, have you ever sensed that? What do you think, Zach? Love God. <laughs> personal experience, right? Yeah, exactly. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Have you ever sensed that we're just talking about things that really don't matter? We're just talking? <clears throat> so, so we need to help them talk about things that really matter. Really show how they could affect their life. And part of that, as Brother Robbins just said, you work through that in your own preparation. What does this look like for a teenager? Does this matter to a teenager? And so, just as an example, will you, will you turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 13? Actually, let's go to 7 first. You'll remember uh, in chapter 7, the, Samuel says, if you'll return to the Lord with all your heart and repent, the Lord will deliver you out of the hands of the Philistines in verse 3. And then let's read verses 8 and 9. Lynn, do you have those? We're in 7. Uh-huh. Okay. Um, and the children of Israel said to Samuel, Cease not to cry to the Lord our God for us, that he will save us out of the hands of the Philistines. And Samuel took a sucking lamb and offered it for a burnt offering holy unto the Lord. And Samuel cried unto the Lord for Israel, and the Lord heard him. And then in, in verse 10, uh, well, let, let's go ahead and, and read what happens in verse 10. Go ahead, Stephen. And as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. But the Lord thundered with a great thunder on that day upon the Philistines and discomfited them. What's discomfited? Caused confusion. Caused confusion among them. Keep going. And they were smitten before Israel. So here's this. They're worried about the Philistines. They need to go to battle. They're going to defeat us. He says, if you turn to the Lord with all your hearts and repent and cry unto the Lord, the Lord will deliver you. Samuel offers a sacrifice in the middle of offering that sacrifice. Imagine this. You're all of Israel. You're gathered around in the middle of offering that sacrifice, and the Philistines are gathering to battle you. Do you get the scene here? What, what comes? Thunder. Boom. Such great thunder that it totally confuses the Philistines, and they defeat the Philistines. Now that's important for what we're going to talk about today. We would have talked about that in the past. But verse 13, or chapter 13, now Saul has been reigning. He's been king for one year. Jonathan, in, in verse 3, goes and attacks a garrison, this, uh, this place of arms and where soldiers come. He attacks this garrison of the Philistines, and news gets around to the Philistines that Jonathan has done this. And the Philistines are angry. They're frustrated, and they want to fight Israel. Okay, let's pick up at verse 5. Parker, go ahead. Yeah, and the Philistines gathered themselves together to fight with Israel, 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen, and people as the sand, which is on the seashore in multitude. Okay. So it's like Jonathan has stirred a hornet's nest here, right? <laughs> Just, just to give you a picture, I googled. Do you know how big ISIS is right now? They, they project about 30,000 militant fighters. So you have ISIS here. Okay, you have this army, the Philistines. And they are, I mean, they're looking and going, they're more than the sands of the seashore. Right? 
and they are scared. How would you be feeling? I mean, I want you to picture it. I want you to picture like the desert landscape even. Does that make sense? Picture looking out at this army. And this Philistine army is angry and ready to take you out. And look at what they do in verse 6. Keep going, Parker. When the men of Israel saw that they were in a strait. A strait? That's weird. They're in a strait. What is that? Like a pickle or like yeah. they're in trouble. They're done yeah. Them. One other translation of the Bible says a tight spot. I mean, they're in a bad position here. Okay? Keep going. For the people were distressed. Then the people did hide themselves in caves and in thickets and in rocks and in high places and in pits. Okay, so they are so terrified right now. What did the Israelites start to do? They, they are hiding anywhere they could get cover. They are going to die. They are so scared. Keep going, verse 7. And some of the Hebrews went over Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. As for Saul, he was yet in Gilgal, and all the people followed him, trembling. How are the Israelites feeling? Shaking their brains. Terrified, right? They're hiding. They're running across the Jordan River. I mean, this is a... Do you get the scene here? We are going to be killed. Now, do you remember what happened last time? We just read it in chapter 7. They turn to the Lord. They pray. What does Samuel do? Offer sacrifice, what happens? Boom! And the Lord fights their battle. Saul, you're the leader. What might you want to do right now? Do a little makeshift sacrifice. Where is Samuel? We gotta offer sacrifice. That's how we win these battles. Okay? Verse 8. And he tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. How long would that seven days last? I want you to think and put yourself... You have a Philistine army. Seven days ago, people were hiding in caves and thickets and running across the Jordan River. You've been sitting there for seven days, and the Philistine army is ready to attack at any moment. How much have you slept in seven days? Have you ever had something that kept you up like that? Do you know what? It's so stressed and worried, and I bet we can't even imagine. And Saul is sitting here like, Samuel said he was coming. Now, we know that because look at, uh, well, well, we'll read on. Keep going, Parker. Uh, but Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. Scattered. They begin to scatter. Everyone's just scattering. Okay, keep going. And Saul said, Bring hither a burnt offering to me, and peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. What does Saul do? He goes as far as I'll do the sacrifice. Go get me a lamb. What's the equivalent? Give me an equivalent in our church today. I, I, I don't know. This is probably a little too unrealistic, but the priests haven't showed up to bless the sacrament, and so... A woman's like, all right, I got this. You know, yeah. If the boys aren't going to show up on time, I'll prepare the sacrament. Right? Yeah, like blessing. You walk in. Can you imagine the shock of walking in? And this has nothing to do with sisters in the church or anything like that. But could you imagine? You walk in. The bishop's held up. There's been something that's held up the whole bishopric. And the Relief Society presidency just said, you know what? We got this. And they're blessing the sacrament. When you walk in. Can you imagine how shocking and weird that would feel? Or what about this? You're sitting around waiting for the sealer. The couple's in there. You know what? Uh, let's go. The reception's in like... The photographer, we only have him for like another half an hour. Let's get there. I'll do it. Could you imagine what people would be thinking? That's the equivalent of what Saul has just done. And then we have this, verse 10, and it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of the overt offering, as soon as it's over, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him that he might salute him. And Samuel said, What hast thou done? And Saul said, Because I saw the people were scattering, and that thou camest not within the days appointed, 
You said you would come, and you hadn't come yet. And that the Philistines gathered themselves together, therefore I said unto the Philistines, will come down now upon me to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication to the Lord. I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. And what does Samuel say to him? Foolish. Now it's done foolishly, and I'm going to take away the kingdom from you. The Lord is going to appoint a king. Verse 14, what's this new king going to be like? Man after his own heart. A man after his own heart. Saul, you're, you're going your own way. All of a sudden you think you're so important that you can just bow off or sacrifice. God needs a king after his own heart. What really, will you tell me, let's look at the realness of it though. If you're Saul and you were to talk back to Samuel here, how many of you can sympathize with Saul a little bit here? Tell me, what, why? I mean, you know, if I were Saul, I was really concerned for my people. I mean, I mean, I know that we need the Lord's help, so all I was really trying to do is just make sure that we had the Lord on our side. And, I mean, I was offering sacrifice. So I, it'd be easy for me to justify, like, all my intentions were good, mm -hmm. right? I was thinking of the people, and, and you were anywhere to be found, so I figured I could just do it. Does the Lord seem to care about that right now? Apparently it does, but I didn't really. So so here's Saul. I mean, how many of you, if Saul were making a case in court, what was I supposed to do? How many of you could say hi? See, when we think of the realness of this, I think it enhances the principle. What's the principle? Exactly. When should we be exactly obedient? I mean, it's scary. It's perfectly convenient. Right of the outcome. So you're you're at a party then. You're new to a town. You're you're just trying to fit in. You know you you probably shouldn't. But it's not like you're getting drunk, right? I mean, if you just take a sip and you know. I mean, does the Lord really expect you, even in that moment, to be obedient? Apparently what? Yes. It's not a Philistine army. It's not seven days of complete nervousness. And the Lord still seems, Saul, no, you should have been obedient. Exact obedience matters even when. What do we learn from this story? When it may result in death. So, so they're facing death, and it's you still have to obey the commandments. What else are you thinking and feeling about this story? Go ahead. I love in verse 14, like there's I think a really powerful implication about Saul. Where you might, you know, have some, you know, empathy for Saul and be like, man, why would the Lord be so harsh against Saul? But like, the Lord is seeking a man after his own heart. I think there's an interesting implication there about Saul. That Saul really, that this was about Saul. That this wasn't necessarily about the Lord and about doing the will of the Lord from the beginning. That his heart was, was somewhere else. So I think that's another essential principle, you know, that we need to always be seeking to, to do what the Lord would have us do. It's not my will, it's the Lord's will that we seek to do at all times. It's interesting you say we should always do that. And this story tells us that always includes what? <clears throat> when faced with death. Even when we're faced with things as serious as death, we obey. And so, my question is, young adults right now, not, not youth, but you, are there things the Lord is asking young adults right now, those who are just newly married, those who are young single adults, that might be hard for you to do right now, that there could be a lot of excuses why not to live certain commandments or do certain things? 
Probably one thing I think about, I mean, the people around them are trembling and scattering, and especially at this stage of our lives, like, there can be, like, financial things that happen when you're dirt poor, can't even afford to go to college, and so you're going to have to make a lot of choices, and, like, I know, I mean, um, probably not anyone in this room, I think, because, but, like, you know, I think, uh, so with paying tithing, I mean, you face the thing, like, am I going to pay my tithing, or, you know, I'll get, I'll get paid next week, you know, so I can just pay it. Pay later or something. So. Does the Lord really expect me to pay tithing when I can bear? I have a kid, for heaven's sakes. My kid might not even be able to eat. Does the Lord really expect me to pay tithing? According to 1 Samuel 13, what's the answer? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, he does. And there's a number of things, and I don't know what each of our things are, but anything we're justifying in our life right now, we're doing wrong. I mean, oh, I'm too busy, or I'm too this, or I'm too that, or I love football, or I love that. <laughs> yeah, apparently, even under extreme circumstances, the Lord expects us to do what? Uh, okay. Okay. Now, that wasn't perfectly done by any means. But do you see how you have to step into Saul's world to really know what Saul was thinking and feeling and the pressures and things that were on him. And if we wouldn't have done that, would the principle have been the same? No. The principle just would have been, obey. And the kids would have been, oh, obey. I've had that one 75 times, right? This year. <laughs> <laughs> but this way, it adds, when you really think of what's going on, it adds the obey what? Exactly, even when it's super hard. super hard to. And by stepping into their world, you bring out that super hardness of it. And then you step into your world, how did we do that? Just asking the question, right? But you bring up something that probably a lot can relate with. Okay. Parker, last comment. I just think it's interesting that like, the deeper, and I think there's obviously a balance, you can't like try and just beat a dead horse, but the deeper you go into their world of the scriptures, it's almost like when you step into, you know, our world, it's that same level of depth. Like, you could just feel it. I don't know, you could just sense the spirit just really like, I don't know, it's a really interesting experience. And so if we just go in a little surface level, then we come over here and it's just going to be a little surface level in our own lives. I agree with that. As you... Deep, it, it almost allows you to make more connections to this life as you go deeper into what they're really experiencing. And so, so that's just those two phrases. Step into their world, meaning the scriptures writer's world. And number two, help your students see how the principles can affect their life. Not people's lives. Their life. And... Uh, as you do that, I, I know the Lord will bless you and say that you just Christ in them. Brother Spencer, will you We're happy to hang here for a few minutes. If you have questions, concerns, anything we can help you with, I do need to see Landon, Elise, and Emily next door in the principal's office <laughs> after after class today. <laughs> We're kind and gracious Heavenly Father. We are great for the opportunity we've had to gather together uh, to be counseled by these good men, um, to learn from their experience and uh, to learn from the resources that we've been given. And uh, Father, we're grateful for uh, one another the support that we can be to one another, and uh, we ask thy spirit to guide us to let us know the ways in which uh, we can change and improve, that we can be better conduits of it for our students. We're grateful for this opportunity we have to teach thy gospel on a daily basis. We love thee and we say this in the name of thy son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you so much.